In our continuing exploration of modern tarot decks, today we take a look at the Darkness of Light Tarot by Tony Di Mauro, an artistically oriented deck and in fact a perfect example of how even in the 21st century tarot cards can still be an object of art. Even more so, I believe, than in previous uh, ages where in the Renaissance they were seen mainly as, as a tool for playing cards. Uh, later they become this esoteric, mystical artifact. Very heavy burdens both being esoteric and being a game. And now since they are freed from those purposes, at least in part, at least in the mind of many users such as myself, then we can appreciate them as objects of art. And in fact, you consider this a very um, artistically inclined deck. It comes with a booklet uh, by the author explaining the process that went behind the deck. It doesn't come physically with the deck, the booklet I mean, but you can find the PDF on the website of the, of the artist, Tony Di Mauro, and you can read it there, you can print it. In that booklet, we learn that the artist decided to borrow heavily from traditional tarot iconography of the 20th century, from the classic uh, Rider White Smith deck. Um, also, however, mixing together ideas from pre Raphaelite pre uh, painting, from symbolism from, uh, it seems to me, from a silent movie, from various other sources, pictorial sources, uh, scattered from here and there. All of these, as seen from Pittsburgh. Yes, the, 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 the artist tells us that, that um, he lived in Pittsburgh and that's one of the cloudiest cities in the US and that inspired him. Um, with the idea of, well, the darkness and light is right there, seeing things through clouds or seeing things when the, when the sun is shining. As you will see, in fact, there's a certain darkness which has a certain gothic aspect, but also at the same time a certain really realistic quality. It's dark not because the, the world is ontologically, mystically dark, but because it is freaking cloudy. So here we have some information about the deck you can pause the image to get more information and here we have this the first card and right there boom we have something unusual which is the name of this card and the name of the major arcana which are in Italian, which are in Italian, in a deck uh, created by an American designer and really mainly meant for English-speaking audiences. How is that possible? Well, the idea was, as the author explains, to pay homage to the origin of the tarot that were created in Italy in the 15th century and also to uh, pay homage to his own heritage as his family is from Italy. More, moreover, there is an interesting idea, in fact, of de, uh, de-automatizing the user's perceptions, or surprising you, giving you the sense of otherness, of strangeness, of uncanny, precisely because they are not in the language that uh, um, most of the users uh, intended for this deck will recognize as the native language, then for them this will be a strange, uh, magical, unusual string of letters. Precisely because of that it may become the vehicle for strange, unusual associations, which is, by the way, why we use the tarots to start with, either for personal insights or for, that, for whatever else. The idea is precisely that they bring us into a parallel world. They make us forget about the, our daily lives for a while and they bring us in this world in which our subconscious can start talking to us. Our subconscious is freed from the constraints of our daily lives. We want to be transported somewhere else. We want a degree of strangeness. So I like that idea very much. This being said, I unfortunately, as somebody who is a native speaker of Italian, I have to say that I'm not particularly happy with some of these translations. Uh, the author did not, in my opinion, go and look at the traditional names of the major arcana in the Italian tradition, but translated from the common English uh, label into Italian, maybe using his own Italian automatic translator or dictionary. 
but it's a stranger fact because then it's not just that they seem um, that they are unusual to me because they're not the traditional name. Sometimes they seem a little too trivial. For example, Pazzo. Pazzo to me, Pazzo is the, the, the Fool is one of the most important uh, cards in the deck. The Fool in Italian is traditionally called Il Folle. By the way, you see Fool, Folle, the connection is there. Or Il Matto. Il Matto is the most common, is the most common translation. And really means, Matto in Folle means Fool in the sense it's sort of like affectionate. It's a sort of like strange way of telling that somebody is kind of like, you know, not quite there. Um, it really is not about mental illness. It's about a strange vision of life. Pazzo is, is a contemporary, it's a modern word, it's a very trivial, it's a very daily one, it means crazy. It's simple as that, ah, quella persona, quello è un pazzo. Um, so it's a little disappointing to me that all the magic of the word folle, pazzo, is lost on me because, oh, sorry, oh, folle or matto is lost on me because of a word that is so conventional. This being said, Looking at the art, as you can see, it's cloudy right there. It's cloudy. It's, that's what happened when Pittsburgh is your inspiration. And I don't have anything against it. Il Mago, again, that's um, traditional. This is Il Bagatto. Il Bagatto. It can be Il Mago sometimes. Uh, the Mago is this mysterious, ambiguous figure. You don't know if it's an alchemist, if it's a real wizard, if he's an illusionist. So if it's somebody who's trying to trick you, that there's an illusionist that pretends to be a magician or an alchemist, or is somebody who is not really tricking you because of, hey, this is a show, I'm putting on a show of fake magic, or is somebody who's not tricking you because they really have magic power. That ambiguity is in the original Bagatto, and I'm not sure, this guy is, it means business to me, it looks more like a druid than a Bagatto. L'alta sacerdotessa. I mean, the art is beautiful. The art is beautiful. I don't complain about that. The symbology and the association sometimes. Eh, but as you've seen from other videos also, I, I can be picky. I like terror. L'imperatrice. Il gelofante. This is just weird. The original card in Italian is il papa, the pope. Probably and precisely to avoid the Catholic connections, many English texts uh, have translated that with the unusual word the hierophant comes from Greek and it means uh, uh, the person that connects the sky and the earth, the, 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 the vessel of magical power on earth, which is precisely, of course, how Catholics see the Pope. But this way that was detached from those religious meanings. So here instead of calling this card the Pope, although the symbology seems to be there, uh, the author translated Hierophant back into Italian when the Italian was the Pope. Il Papa. That's... It's supposed to be mystical, magical, mysterious, just a little weird to me. Gli Amanti. Il Callo. Nice. Forte, this is simply a mistranslation. Forte means strong, the card is strength. La forza. L'eremita. That's a little unclear. I don't know exactly where his head is and the shape that the head has, but I like the fact that the, the shape, the, the, the human figure is realistic, where the sky is sort of like symbolic, really as if the hermit was looking into not the same sky that we we'll look at, but another one. Same idea here with the Vuoto della Fortuna, uh, the Wheel of Fortune. And look at this. I thought this person here. I really like how realistic it looks. It doesn't have the idealized quality of uh, of pre raphaelite painting or of fantasy art. It looks like, like the picture of a Mediterranean Southern Italian girl that is doing a very humble work uh, from back then. And there's a certain realistic vein, almost a Pasolinian, if you watch an old movie by Pasolini, a Pasolinian, neorealistic uh, tone in some of these cards. L'impiccato, um, I'm happy with this one, with how it looks in the translation. La morte, I think I mentioned somewhere else, I'm old school, I prefer the decks that do not have a name here. Traditionally it was done for superstitious, you know, La morte, 
the death you just simply don't mention yeah, just in case death is listening it's like oh somebody called me nope no we didn't say those words we didn't say that name uh it's as a superstition maybe but i like the mystery that the card has when uh, it doesn't have a name yeah i don't believe that if i say death that's gonna show up and if i make it alive until the end of this video it will have proven my point the devil la torre here the words become more linear, there is less, uh, less ambiguity, less, uh, fewer opportunities for me to complain. I like the, again, the, the contrast between the realism of the scene and the abstract quality, or so more abstract quality of what you see in the sky. Giudizio, this really reminds me of old Italian political art uh, from the late 40s. L'universo, traditionally, is il mondo, but I can deal with that. Again, this seems really from, like, an old movie. And then we look a little... Clo a little faster, just so we don't... Yeah, I don't... You don't get too long. I was talking about the Pasolini, and this is a guy that could be in a Pasolini movie. I mean, it really looks like this is someone that the author portrayed, rather than just a general idea. We'll go a little faster so you can still get a sense, but not fall asleep. But as you can see here, so we have the coins, and the coins is metal. The coins are not alive. The coins, as opposed to the cups that have an inside and an outside, they, they are sort of like a portal. They protect it. They, they carry liquids that, that allow us to, to be alive, water, or wine to celebrate. The coin is useful, but it's cold, it's hard. And it's associated with Pittsburgh skies, see, with the dark, um, with the dark, uh, with the dark, um, or this cloudy grayish uh, background, as opposed to the cups, it's definitely lighter. It's still not a Mediterranean sky, it's still a sky that is usually cloudy, but today not nearly as much. Sometimes you do have, yes, these moments of beautiful, colorful light. I like the idea that this sort of like life and death is too easy a simplification, but um, darkness, uh, hardness versus malleability and light, that dichotomy that you see with the coins and the cups is reproduced here with the blades and the wands. And the blades and the wands are again two sides of the same pentacle. And you can see here again the blades are darker. There is definitely a sort of like Northern European iconology here, vaguely Viking in some cards, vaguely Scottish. I mean, this seems, could be you know, a black and white version of a Viking TV show that like, they have been popular the last couple of years. So. But then, uh, we get the ones. The ones come from life. They may be alive. We, and you, we may have to use them to defend ourselves, but they don't kill. They may, they may be burned to, to hurt somebody or to warm up our food, to, to provide somebody with a healthy environment. They can help us walk. I really like how the different palette, well, not striking a different, it's not like really night and day, but more cloudy, less cloudy, really create, really recreates that symbology, that symbology there. Again, without the, the, the contrast between the two being so different and it looks cartoonish. So this is uh, the darkness of light tarot. Very original, sort of, sort of almost like an encyclopedia of different motifs, styles, very postmodern. This is an author that doesn't fear to quote. It's not afraid of quoting, and that is perfectly fine. Because we do live in a postmodern slash neo-baroque age, and quoting is what we do. We are an, we, we are an old civilization, and we feel old. We feel that by by quoting, appropriating, uh, hybridizing, um, cutting and pasting things, we get more in contact with our culture, and then and then we also you know find a place in the culture because it's not just so much about preserving the past in a museum, but making the past alive again in new ways by mixing, matching, and combining. 
the scale of Pittsburgh with the tarot, with silent film, uh, with pre Raphael painting, with symbolist painting, all of these together uh, do uh, work quite nicely. I really like the visual effect. As you have, as you know by now, I'm not very happy with the Italian translations. Um, I hope that maybe there will be a new version of the deck in which those Italian translations will use the traditional names for the major arcana in the Italian tarot tradition. Other than that, that's a minor thing. For you, if you don't speak Italian, I think those will work just fine. Those strings of lines, of wild lines in a in a black background will work just as well for you to create associations, ideas, images, echoes, uh, whatever thing will come to mind. It will work great for you. For me, paradoxically, that creates an interference because it brings a certain mundane, almost trivial aspect of the language to the fore and it's something that I wish I could leave behind when I'm, when I'm using a tarot deck. Small complaint, the darkness of light tarot overall very beautiful very attractive deck